So hello everyone. Good afternoon on this Friday, January 8th, and I'm Joe Flick. I'm I'm just your facilitator today. I'm going to immediately uh, turn things over to Jenny in just a second. I just want to remind you that, oops, I'm sorry. Let me get to the start of my screen. I totally screwed that up. Okay. So all of these website chats are recorded and posted to our Vimeo channel. We have a special showcase just for the website chats and you can usually view the last, the most recent two or three of them. Um, and I do try to get them posted as quickly as possible after the chat because it's usually pretty newsy contemporary information. So, and we know that a lot of people do uh, tune in to watch them within a few days. So. Uh, Anytime you have to miss the chat, just let just tune into our Vimeo channel. It's a good page to bookmark. Um, I wanted to point out that we have an awful lot of training coming up in the next um, few weeks. We're going to be starting up the Aspen Basics course in again in February. I, I don't have that scheduled yet, but watch for information on that. Uh, and those of you who may have attended sections of the Aspen Basics course last year we ran one um, we ran it from I think we started in June or July and it ran through the end of the year we actually had to skip a couple months because we were making some changes in Aspen and we wanted you to have the most up-to-date information so um, if you have any ideas for me or feedback about the Aspen Basics course on how if you attended any of them let me know because I'd like to make sure that it meets your needs so we're also uh, ramping up some training that Trace, I see Tracy's online, so you can drop her a note if you have any questions about this. Um, and, and this is part of our um, equity, diversity and inclusion training initiatives that we've undertaken with an um, IMLS grant that Tracy's overseeing. And this is working with several other of our neighboring states. So. Uh, there's going to be, Suzanne's running a series of these webinars. It's actually, each webinar is the same, but we, we scheduled it several times so we could accommodate all the people who wanted to attend. That's the We're All In This Together webinar. And then there's a two-part series called Unpacking Racial Literacy um, with a terrific presenter out of Seattle. And I'm um, pretty excited about this training that's coming up. So any questions about that, go to Tracy. Amelia's got summer reading webinars starting up very soon. Um, of course, we're going to be talking a little bit about virtual summer reading activities. So as we know, a lot of you um, kind of got stuck having to do virtual <laughs> um, summer reading activities last year, and we're not sure how what's going to happen this year. So there'll be some chat about that. Um, I have planned a webinar next month with the Rural Institute at the University of Montana, and they're going to be talking about all of their resources that they have. This is good information for librarians to know to how to refer a patron who um, maybe has a medical issue that they are encountering and suddenly need um, some adaptive equipment for a short term period or uh, they, the Rural Institute also has a number of terrific resources for young parents. And I wanted to make sure you guys were all um, up to date on, on what they're doing. It's been a long time since we've done a webinar with them. So look for that. And then Amelia being busy little bee that she is, is also, uh, planning some economic development in libraries webinars and uh, and so you watch for that information and she's continuing to host um, COVID meetups every other week to provide updates because things certainly are changing on that front as well. So there's just a lot of training. I hope you'll um, check in the Aspen calendar and, uh, and, and get signed up for those. So today, Jenny, I'm going to turn it over to you. Where's, we're Ooh. at the start of another legislative session. Oh, boy, it is coming fast and furious. Let me tell you, um, I'm trying to adjust my, my camera so I don't look quite so shadowed. So I apologize for that today. Um, I have a number of things I want to talk about. And at one point in the last few days, someone asked for just a refresher on how to search for legislative bills. So I did want to spend just a little bit of time looking at the legislative website. We'll get to that in just a, a few minutes. But lot, lots of news to discuss 
um, just from this past week. And um, staff, some of this will be newsy information for you as well. I just haven't had a chance to get an email out to folks. Uh, of course, in addition to the legislative session, we have a new governor who was sworn in on Monday and we're becoming familiar with him and his staff. Um, he's in the process of appointing his cabinet. Of course, we work very closely with state agencies. And so this is a, a shift in their leadership and, and we'll be monitoring what kinds of shifts and, shifts and priorities they have um, coming to know the, the new leadership of those agencies. Uh, I've had one conversation with Jean Forte's new budget director, Kurt Almy, um, and was very impressed that he took the time to reach out on an issue pertaining to the state library's budget last week. So um, changes there, and, and I know we're all anxiously watching to see what happens with this new administration from a different political party. Gianforte did announce his budget yesterday and uh, the, the changes that he's proposing from Governor Bullock's budget that came out last month with regard to the state library's budget are relatively minor, nothing too significant. Um, there's some personal services savings included there that weren't in Governor Bullock's budget, but nothing unusual at all. Um, um, some additional personal services money changes that really have no significance for us. The primary change that is included in Jean Forte's budget pertains to what is in the budget to backfill some of the volatility in the coal severance tax fund. You all know that the state library receives coal severance tax funds that um, in large part is what we use to fund the federation dollars that you all receive. Um, it helps us to fund some of our statewide projects. We use it to fund the ongoing digitization of state government publications and to provide of the online access to the web archive of state agency websites and, and those kinds of programs. What had been included in Governor Bullock's budget was a complete shift from coal severance tax to the general fund and a proposal to take the state library off of coal severance tax. And in discussing that change with the state library commission, we were generally in favor of the change because we don't have any confidence in the future of coal revenues to be a, a viable source of funding for libraries going forward. But of course, we've had some experience in budget cuts with general fund as well. So it was with sort of cautious support that the State Library Commission um, recognized that shift in, in Governor Bullock's budget. What is being proposed in Governor Gianforte's budget is uh, we're leaving the State Library on coal, um, but backfilling the current projected loss of coal revenue with general fund. So not a complete shift off of general fund, but just using general fund to backfill the declining cash that's coming into that coal severance tax account. And then other thing included in Gianforte's budget is a reduction in the appropriation of that uh, coal severance tax line within the state library's budget so that the general fund that is backfilling that loss of coal wouldn't be quite as much as we're seeing in Bullock's budget. So while we were, well, this will mean less appropriation than what was in Bullock's budget, it's still a significant cash increase over the amount of cash the state library has to spend on these priorities over this current fiscal year. Even though the state library's appropriation for coal severance tax monies this year is about $567,000, 
the actual cash revenue projections for coal are only about 420 or 430,000. So we have no ability to, to spend beyond that cash. Um, so we're, we're going to end up losing a, about 120 to 130 thousand dollars in um, that appropriation this year in the next biennium if what the governor is proposing is approved then um, we'll actually have somewhere around ninety thousand dollars more in actual cash that we can spend and I know that's kind of confusing but um, while I hate to lose that authority, I'd much rather have the money to actually be able to spend. Any questions about what we're seeing in the Forte's budget? And then I just briefly wanted to touch on what we're hearing with regard to, to Gian Forte's plans for the pandemic. Uh, you've probably seen in the media that he's starting to talk about lifting the mask mandate and tying when he would change that mandate to the vaccination plan and some other legislative priorities that he has. So we make a fairly significant change in the vaccination plan rollout from what was originally uh, proposed under the Bullock administration. He took out those two populations that were originally in tier 1C and made them tier 1B. The, that population is um, in Bullock's plan, it was people over 65. In Gianforte's new plan, it's people over 70. And then people over 16 that have certain health vulnerabilities. Those two populations, people over 70 and people with certain health vulnerabilities, will now be the new Tier 1B. And as areas of the state are completing vaccinations of those largely healthcare providers in tier 1A, they'll begin to move on to this tier 1B. And Gianforte estimates that there are between 250 and 300,000 people to be vaccinated. After that, the state will move into tier 1C. And in tier 1C, it includes uh, groups, frontline workers and groups like educators. And what we are hearing is that librarians will be eligible to receive the vaccine in that tier 1C group. I don't have that word officially from the State Department of Public Health. I'm waiting to get that information from them, but I've heard from two local health departments that that's where librarians will be eligible for the vaccine. So that's in the tier 1C. Um, which happens after tier 1B. There's a significant population to be vaccinated in tier 1B, and so it'll take some time to get through uh, that tier before additional vaccinations would be made available. And just jumping in here, I mean, you're, you're, it's a chat, so you can get in and chat, you can either use the chat box to either make a comment, share some information that maybe you're hearing, and, or you can, um, anytime Jenny takes a pause, you're just welcome to unmute your microphone and jump into the conversation. We're happy to, yeah. to keep it um, casual. So those are the two key things at, this week out of the Gianforte administration that I wanted to be sure to pass on to all of you. And then moving into the legislative session. First, I just really want to acknowledge and thank the great work of the MLA Government Affairs Committee, uh, especially Anne Eubank and Rachel Ron, who are chairing that committee. They're doing a great job of making sure that committee members are informed about how to search for bills. We're taking steps to make sure we're organized in tracking the bills and we'll be taking efforts to make sure that we as a committee 
respond rapidly when necessary to provide information to legislators and Nanette Gilbertson, the MLA lobbyist on, on our views of um, legislation that's being considered. And then as we get further into the session, making sure that all of you know of important legislation and have the ability to communicate views to legislators when those actions are necessary. There are, as of yesterday, we'll look here in just a minute at how many more, but as of yesterday, 3,148 bill draft requests. So I don't think we topped 3,000 last session. So considerably more bill draft requests this session that we're monitoring. Um, legislators, many of them are meeting in person in Helena. Some of them are wearing masks, some are not. Uh, there is access to participate in the hearings online, and I'll show you how to access that in just a minute. Uh, and so far, uh, most legislative committees are supportive of the option to allow people to testify remotely, so we really appreciate that. So far, I haven't had to go to the Capitol. Uh, one um, legislator has tested positive for the coronavirus um, and um, he's someone important to us. He's our, our committee chair for our budget subcommittee, and he's also a sponsor of some of our legislation. So we wish Representative Beatty very well, and, and um, we're glad that he's asymptomatic but is positive, so he is quarantining. And at this point, we hope he can continue his efforts uninterrupted. So there are a couple of pieces of legislation already that I wanted to bring to your attention. The first is House Bill 78. It's a bill that would require uh, organizations who provide organized children's activities to be mandatory reporters for suspected child abuse. Um, and it doesn't explicitly name libraries as one of those organizations, but based on the general language of the bill, I think we can assume that libraries would be expected to be these mandatory reporters. Um, so far, what we've heard is uh, not a lot of concern from librarians about having to be mandatory reporters, but I did want to bring that bill to your attention. Um, one question that was raised was whether or not the bill would violate library records confidentiality and that law. And I don't believe that it would. There's nothing in the this proposed legislation that would require libraries to disclose information about uh, the kinds of information or materials that patrons are accessing, which would be the concern for the Library Records Confidentiality Act. Um, but that's a bill that we'll certainly be monitoring the other bill, and, and Tracy, I need you to remind me of the bill draft number, is a bill that was introduced in 2015 that would put an automatic sunset on uh, voted levies for different services within local government. And MLA worked really hard with the sponsor, Greg Hertz, in 2015 to exempt libraries and library voted levies from that legislation. And I'm happy that as introduced, libraries are still exempt from what Representative Hertz is proposing. So that's good news going forward, but we do anticipate that we'll have to defend why libraries should be exempted from that. And so that's a point that the Government Affairs Committee will be talking about um, there are many, many other pieces of legislation that we're monitoring, um, trying to learn a little bit more about as the actual language of the bills uh, becomes available for us to review. Question from the chat box, Jenny, for you, and that is, um, does the governor say anything about working from home or what are you hearing? Oh, good question. Good question. Uh, at least with regard to state employees, he is continuing the work from home order for the foreseeable future. 
um, and he's encouraging his own staff to continue to work from home. And thanks to Tracy for posting that um, mill levy bill in the chat box. I appreciate that. Tracy, were there any pieces of legislation that you wanted to mention? Yeah, um, one that I am watching, it's not yet been referred to committee, is about revising mill levy election laws and it's House Bill 107. Um, and it would change the mill levy election laws from majority. So the county commission could uh, enact a mill levy if the majority of people voted yes for it, it would change it from that to two thirds. And so that is um, something that might be a bit of a challenge, not just for libraries, uh, actually for any district that might be running a mill levy or asking for additional mill levies. And so that is a bill that I am watching pretty closely. Yeah. I think that is it, Jenny, um, at this point. Four days in, five days in, right day five. So the state library's budget will be heard by the Education Budget Subcommittee on February 8th. Uh, that's a, a Monday, Monday morning. And we'll start thinking about what we want that hearing to look like and working with the MLA Government Affairs Committee to talk about uh, what librarians we might ask to testify in support of the state library budget. Um, overall, I think we're in a pretty good position right now. I'm not hearing uh, too many causes for concern. I'm going to be talking extensively about the essential services that we provide, some of the conversations that we've been having for the last many months, um, trying to shift the argument from whether or not libraries are essential to the essential nature of the services we provide and examples of what those services mean for individuals in our communities and starting to shape my budget testimony uh, around those kinds of talking points. Um, also within the state library budget is included a change package that will increase the funding for our per capita per square mile state aid. There's nothing legislatively that needs to occur to ensure that libraries continue to receive their state aid this biennium. Again, that's a statutory appropriation. It was renewed in 2017. It comes up for renewal again in 2023. So, um, we don't need to do anything to reauthorize that. We of course need to be able to defend state aid. And so I really encourage all of you to think about how you use your state aid funds, what impact that has for your patrons and be able to talk about some of those kinds of examples with your board and with your legislators so they know how important that funding is to your library. The statutory appropriation is tied to the census. And you maybe saw the news that the census delayed releasing information about the official census results. They were due at the end of December and those numbers are delayed. Uh, as soon as they are available, we will know exactly how much funding will be available for state aid in this next biennium. Right now within our budget is a small change package anticipating some increase in the census. And between now and the end of the legislative session, we'll make sure that that change package is tied to the actual decennial census numbers uh, from the 2020 census. I know there's a question from Kelly about changes with Schools. Are you are you specifically referring to um, the pandemic? I should say I'm I'm not hearing anything specific to schools at this point. The question is: Had 
of um, our libraries setting policy, particularly around the pandemic, to support the school's efforts to flatten the curve. So we'll wait for her to come back with. Yeah. So I'd there's love anything to know more else? about what your what, your, um, what kinds of policies you're setting. And then from um, Heather in Rosebud um, County, I just used state aid to purchase air purifiers to improve air quality in library spaces. Not sexy, but critical. Absolutely. Yeah. So let me talk just a little bit. One, one more little thing about the census before you move on. Um, and yeah. it might be a little bit more in the chat box. This is from Jennifer um, Dash. They had to cut the census short, right? I was wondering why they can't get, look at property records and at least count one person per property. Yeah, they have, I, I can maybe get a little bit, and Jenny jump in here, but. Um, <laughs> So the census was originally scheduled to go on through um, the end of October because of COVID, because they had such a late start in getting enumerators into the field. Um, and that, that was cut short by the administration federal, at the federal level. And, um, and it went through some, there's probably going to be litigation because the Census Bureau does have um, processes that they use. They use different kinds of administrative records um, to kind of fill in gaps and holes that they can identify. I mean, they've been doing this for hundreds of years. So they, they know when they've got the numbers wrong, they can, they can tell. And, they, and the Census Bureau does lots of stuff in the 10 years between the, um, the official federal census that, that apportionment and um, and and how money is sent out from the federal government is determined. So they have lots of other data, but how they use that data is very controversial. And um, everybody wants to have a say in how that data is used and how those numbers are arrived at. So it just, we don't know enough about it yet is my take on it. Do you have anything else you want to add to that, Jenny? You're, you, you, um, you get some information from the federal level that I don't see, so. Yeah, so, um, you know, as Joe said, litigation over the process and, and the fact that it was cut short. Also litigation about whether or not to count undocumented people. The census is supposed to count everyone. And there's been some litigation from the presidential administration to block counting people who are undocumented. And so I think that's one of the things that's delaying the release of the current numbers. Um, you know, it, it by constitution, we have to count everyone. So, you know, that that is the effort, as Joe said, that has been followed for hundreds of years. There are certainly other ways to count people, um, different kinds of statistical surveys that are used between the decennial census. But um, by constitution, we have to attempt to account, account for every single individual. Um, and then, um, as Joe was describing, um, according to, to federal law, um, despite the fact that we are counting everyone, individuals, nothing about how the data is disclosed is allowed to uh, identify individual persons. Uh, and that stems from back in World War II when census data was used to identify people of Japanese heritage to round them up and, and put them into internment camps. Um, since that time, it's been um, illegal to use that information to identify individuals and uh, that people go to great lengths to protect that kind of information. Um, given the demographic nature of this, the census data that's collected in some of our very rural areas, especially when um, we're collecting information about people of color and, and minorities, we might be able to identify certain individuals looking at that data at a granular enough level. So the census fuzzes that data um, to prevent people from being able to be uniquely identified. Uh, and that's a process that has occurred 
um, for many decades through the census process. It's being, that process is being changed now, how they are working at fuzzing that information will be changed. And it'll be changed in such a way that it strips population numbers from our most rural areas. And people are very concerned about what that means because uh, we all know we, re we rely on those census dollars to fund services, um, $2,000 per individual per year in Montana. Uh, we need to be able to rely on those dollars. Uh, as you all know, our, our library state aid um, is partially tied to a per capita count um, down to the county level according to administrative rule. And we need to know that we can confidently rely on those census counts down to that uh, community level to be able to adequately award state aid. So that's something that is of concern um, across the country and officials across the country are working to change course to uh, redirect the census back to their historic practices. In the meantime, we're trying to understand what this means for state aid and, and what we might do about it if in fact we don't have confidence with census data down to that local level. And, and the good news, but the good news is that it does look like Montana has, um, that Montana census numbers will support the addition of, an, of one more representative in the house. And so we'll hear more about that in the upcoming months. And then the, por the apportionment um, process, the process of redrawing all of our um, all of our lines for our representatives in state government, and and drawing that line across Montana for the two um, the two house seats, that process will begin uh, later. And it, originally, I think it was scheduled to start up in April, but it may be later now because of the of the what's going on at the federal level. And I do know that the um, the office that we worked with the, at the state level to get information out about the census and to try to improve self reporting all of you libraries who are involved with the census champions um, activity that we've done in, over the last year that there that there's a lot of interest in having libraries be engaged in helping with the apportionment committee, which is a bipartisan group that draws, draws those lines according to state law, but they need to get public input. And so we might be hearing yeah. more about that. We haven't, I mean, we'll see when we when the time comes. Anyway, there's quite a bit. Kelly explains um, what she was talking about. A apparently in Sydney, kids are arranged into a color group. Um, um, this isn't racial color. This is just their assigned, you know, red, blue, yellow. And that as a result, the library is trying to, these kids are supposed to stay in there in that bubble. And so the library is closed except by appointment. And um, that's in order to help support the school to keep kids from gathering, have, giving them gathering places in the community. So thanks for sharing that, Kelly. That's yeah, good information good to know. Information. Just a couple more quick points on the census before we move on. Um, if you want more information about the what I just described and the, the process to, to fuzz that kind of information, the director of the state Census and Economic Information Center, Mary Craigle, is going to present on the issue to the State Library Commission at their February 10th commission meeting. So I encourage you to turn, tune into that meeting. And I want to be really clear. Um, as Joe said, we anticipate that the population of Montana has increased and in, in the decennial census will reflect that. So the total dollar amount for state aid will increase based on that population increase um, and how we're looking at um, how we divide up that new increased total amount is affected by how the, the census numbers are, are going to be allocated across the state. So just wanna be clear that we do anticipate libraries will see an increase overall in their state aid. Um, so let me, let me switch gears and, and direct people's attention to the legislative website. And maybe Joe, you can um, make me a host so I can share my screen.
Joe, I'm not sure if I didn't see a pop up. Excellent. All right, does everybody see the legislative website? I am at leg.mt.gov. And the first thing I wanna bring your attention to is this option in the middle where you can select if you want to provide testimony at a legislative hearing. There's just an online form to complete about who you are, who you represent, whether or not you want to uh, support or oppose a bill or you're just an informational witness. Um, it asks for some contact information. Um, just a, a brief description of any intended testimony that you plan to give. You can also upload your testimony. Uh, so if you have written testimony, you can share that. That can be useful, especially if they're having technical difficulties with the hearing. Legislators will still have an opportunity to get your testimony in written form. And then you, you can select whether or not you wanna testify via Zoom. You'll get an email confirmation that they've received your request and then you'll receive uh, login information for the, the Zoom login for that hearing. There is a window of time when you need to request access to participate. Um, and that window is no less than noon the day before a hearing but no more than three days before the hearing. So um, if you're wanting to testify, um, you can select what bill you want to testify for. And if you're not, not seeing a bill number here, it means that um, you need to check back in a little bit later uh, within that one to three day window to make sure that um, uh, the bill the bill is available for you to select. If it's not here, it's probably too early. This option is to actually participate in the hearing, but anyone can always listen to the hearings um, either by um, listening to them via audio or listening to them um, some, some committees have audio, some committees have video, and you can always um, just check through this hearing schedule, um, or there's also a, a live, sorry, it's behind my little, my little uh, screen here, watch and listen to meetings. If you select this option, it will take you to a viewer and you can see all of the hearings that are currently available. They're on their noon hour right now, so um, not a lot going on. You can listen and watch the floor sessions for the House and the Senate. And then if you scroll through this list of hearings, you'll see that it includes hearings um, for several days in the future as well. So a great way to just kind of keep tabs on the work of the legislature. Uh, I've been really impressed so far with the hearings that I've watched in terms of how well the committee is making use of Zoom. Um, in some cases, legislators themselves are participating via Zoom rather than being there in person. Um, committee chairs are doing a good job of calling on remote participants to provide testimony uh, as proponents and opponents to bills and allowing for questions and interaction between in-person legislators and the, and the people online as well. And the committees are well staffed with people knowledgeable about the use of Zoom to make, sh to make sure that, that that process is going smoothly. I also wanted to draw your attention to the legislator lookup information. Um, you can search by an address. If you don't know who the legislator is that you're looking for, you can enter your address and find out who your legislators are. 
or you can um, search by the roster and search by a legislator's name. And then most legislators will have information about how to contact them, their email address and telephone number. So uh, I very much encourage you to get used to emailing um, or picking up the phone and calling a legislator and telling them who you are and what position you're taking on a bill. I'm gonna come back to the home page here. also wanted to point out that through the website, you can send a message directly to a leg legislator. Again, this is an online form that you can complete and you can identify who you are, um, the issue that you want to talk about, uh, the bill and any information you wanna share. And this information will go directly to those legislators. So lots of good ways to communicate with legislators. And as I said, as we get further into the session, as these bills that we've talked about come up and, and more bills uh, will, will undoubtedly come up for us to take positions on. And you'll be hearing from members of the MLA Government Affairs Committee asking you to get in touch with your legislator to share a position. These are good ways to be able to do that. I'm gonna show you now how to access the laws database. And if you've been around for any previous set sessions and have paid attention to bills, this will look very familiar to you because it's the same database system that, that they've had in place for several years now. Several different ways to get to this database, most obviously is just on the homepage here with this bill search. You can also come down to from laws and bills and follow the link to the 2021 session bill lookup. This will all take you to the same place. So this is what the laws database looks like. You can search by bill number if you know what the bill number is. So, um, you know, for example, I mentioned House Bill 78, the mandatory repeater bill. I can search that way and it will bring me to specific bill information. Um, if a bill has not been introduced yet, uh, for example, the bill that Tracy mentioned uh, with regard to the this Mill Levy Sunset has an LC number. LC stands for Legislative Council. It means the bill hasn't been introduced, but you can still search by that bill number, that LC number, and it'll bring you to the same information about a bill, even if it hasn't been introduced. One of the things I do on a daily basis right now is come down to this list, all introduced and unintroduced bills, and just look at what those bills are. Uh, I mentioned yesterday when I looked at bills that there were 3,148 bill drafts. I'm just gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom. Sorry, I'm on a tablet. So this is gonna take just a little while. Oh boy, it's gonna take a long time. There we go. So 3,159, so 11 new bill drafts since yesterday. Uh, what, what I like to do is just look at the short title of these bills. They don't provide you with a lot of information, um, but provide some general information. Sorry, I'm trying to move some things around about what will be contained in that legislation. Um, the title of the bill, the short title of the bill is very important because um, what is actually then proposed in the language of the bill has to directly tie to the short title of the bill. Um, so uh, when you see something that says generally revise a law, um, it, it, it gives a, a legislator great discretion to provide broad language changes. Um, 
So those are ones where we will always want to look at the language of the bill um, versus a, a very specific title like an appointee for the commissioner of the, the Department of Labor. We know that that's going to be the, the legislation to appoint Governor Gianforte's uh, director for Department of Labor and so forth. What I like to do is come into this page and do um, just to find on the page a control F and look for search terms that are of importance to me. So I'll always come in and just look for, I usually limit it to library, library and, and that will bring back library and libraries and see if there's any uh, new bill drafts that pertain to libraries specifically, you can see the first draft uh, that's brought back is one of our funding bills for the state library. And then I'm gonna come down to the second one and it's um, this generally revised laws related to libraries from Senator Pomnikowski. Um, Senator Pomnikowski always includes this kind of placeholder bill. And you can see that the draft is on hold. So she hasn't introduced any actual language, but what she's done is created a placeholder and she does this every session. Um, and the reason she does that is that if she sees the potential for negative legislative changes to impact libraries, she has a, a placeholder bill that can be used to introduce language that would protect libraries. So this is a, a placeholder mechanism that, that she uses to protect the interests of libraries. Um, and if nothing comes up that she's concerned about, this bill draft will just go away and nothing will come of it. I wanted to just take a quick moment and show you um, what it looks like to look at the information on a bill page. And I'm gonna use this 911 funding for the state library bill. If you just select the, the link to the bill itself, um, there's some good useful information here. So all of the most recent activities pertaining to a piece of legislation will be listed on this page with the most recent information first. Um, so up at the top of the page, you can see the text of the bill. And if I click on this, it'll bring up the actual language of the bill. Um, you'll always have the current text as bills get amended. It'll show you both the previous versions of the bill as well as the current text of the bill. It'll tell you who the sponsor is and there's a link to legislative information if you need to contact that legislator. Um, you can see by this information that the bill has been introduced and it has a hearing on Monday at 3 p.m. There's information about the committee where the bill will be heard on Monday. And as we move, our, move through the legislative process, this information will continue to be updated as action occurs on the bill. Scrolling down, there's more information about the sponsorship of the bill, information about um, the subjects that are included in the bill, um, whether or not the bill is gonna have a fiscal note, transmittal deadlines, and, and those kinds of things. I wanted to point out that these subjects are tied to some of the search functionality within the laws database. I'm just gonna go back a couple of times here so you can see what I mean. Within the laws database, there is some search function that allows you to search by subject. Um, and I'll just scroll down. One of the subjects is libraries. The search functionality is not good. Um, and it looks like it's taking a little bit of time here to bring, to bring back any search results. Let's try that again. Um, 
So just as Joe just jumping in here, you so you use the control F function um, ability to function yeah. to search the website um, using the the browser function instead of yeah instead of by subject by subject exactly right um, and um, it's it's you know it's a function of people creating good metadata about the bills. If, if the, the people entering bills into the system aren't creating good metadata, the, the search functionality is just not gonna be there. And, and that's typically what I find. Um, you know, and as you can see here, it's actually bringing back bills from other sessions, which that's not helpful either. They need more librarians on their staff, create good metadata. There is also. Kara is asking who enters the data, legislative services staff? Yeah, the, the drafters, the, the legislative services staff drafters, the bill drafters. And there and is. If, as, you're, as you're moseying around here, Nancy had a question about the liabil COVID liability um, legislation. So maybe you can dig into that a little bit as you're moving around and we and I'll bring the question was basically does that mean libraries wouldn't be liable if people are where are not wearing masks I mean I'll get to that question in just a second I'm just going to show you one more search option and that's this search text of bills using keywords um, it's also not working so it really takes a lot of drilling. It takes you to this um, search box, this Google search box, and you can search by bills. Um, and um, again, it, even though I have the 2021 session in my search string, it's bringing back bills from, you know, 2001, 2007, yuck, yuck, yuck. I can sort by date. I hope you all are as appalled as I am about this because I'm I'm appalled by this. You know, it takes me out of my bills when I switch to um, switch dates. So I have brought this to the attention of legislative services staff, and I really hope they address it soon because um, this is a disservice to the citizens of Montana if we can't appropriately access the the over 3,150 bills. We need to be able to to trust that we can find the information about these bills that we need. All right, that's my soapbox. Um, the COVID liability, um, Governor Gianforte said that uh, in addition to completing phase 1B of the vaccine plan, um, in order to lift the mask mandate, he wants to see the legislature enact legislation uh, that would um, uh, prevent, or uh, I guess, um, ensure that organizations are not held liable for um, any kind of COVID results if they don't have a mask mandate. Um, he's spoken specifically about businesses, schools, and churches. I would assume he would include local governments in that. I have not seen any draft legislation yet. Um, Let's see if we can see if we can just find something as we're looking here. So I'm going to go to this list bills. Let's just do a search for COVID. Let's see if I can. I've got too many screens open. See if we can come down here. Jump in here with Heather's comment. If librarians were in charge, all would be right in the world. I 100% believe that. Amen. That's, that's from, from Heather, but I think we all agree. Yeah. So just looking here, there's four bills with COVID in the title. One looks like it's pertaining to education laws, um, teacher retirement, Let's keep going down here, see what we can find. 
workers' compensation for COVID. That might impact libraries who staff um, yeah. get sick at work or feel like they or um, believe they were they got sick at work. Mm -hmm. so here's one so study commission to review COVID-19 statute and rule suspensions. That would be one to potentially keep our eye on uh, that might have to do with um, organizational liability. So. Let's try Corona. How, how do I spell Corona? C-O-R-O-N-A. So, nothing related to coronavirus. So right now there's only those four pieces of legislation, at least from the short title that have, that have to do with the pandemic. Um, there, there's always a chance that um, one of these other um, bill drafts could contain Legislation, let's see if we can find this one. Pandemic Homeschool Relief Act. So I, my suggestion would be that we continue to come in and, and keep searching in this way for legislation that's related to the pandemic. Um, and then as we see language pop up, we'll be able to look at it and have a better sense of, of what kind of immunity it might give to organizations. We were at the top of the hour and um, I did notice a couple of people had to have, have left, but um, this was uh, this is a good review and um, the, the new um, the new face they have for legislative, you know, the, the, the new website look, it's very cool, but basically once you get into the guts, it's the same old um, laws database. So that should be in pretty familiar to everyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I just wanted to then remind folks, we're not doing our legislative open house like we typically do because of the pandemic, obviously, and, and a lot of legislators just, um, either attending remotely and, and not encouraging those kinds of gatherings in any way. Um, throughout the session, I think we'll be doing some online educational sessions with legislators and we're still talking about ways to organize meetings with legislators with the MLA Government Affairs Committee. So um, really important for you to know who your legislators are, be watching Wired for alerts when we need to be in communication with legislators. Think about your state aid, think about what positive stories you want to communicate to your legislators about that kind of funding. And um, the state library certainly appreciates all the support that you give us for our budget as we go through the session. All right. Well, with that, I, unless you have anything else, Jenny, I'll go ahead and stop our recording. We will stay on the line if um, you're, if you're here and have some other questions or um, want to chat about something. Um, but anything else, Jenny, or are we ready to stop the recording? I think we're ready to stop. Okay, so thanks for tuning in. And if you are watching the recording, be sure to claim your credit um, in Aspen. <laughs>